Okay, Paul, welcome to the summit. Um, I think, you know, a question I'd like to start off by asking is, you've spent the best part of your working life focused on um, applying or understanding and applying compassion to alleviate suffering in the world. And I'm just, you know, I, I want to understand why you've decided to focus so much of your time and energy on this. Uh, yeah, maybe could you start off by telling us why that's the case? Well, originally, uh, just to tell you the story of background, which might be interesting, I uh, did my PhD in Edinburgh, which was doing a lot of studies on the pharmacology of depression, trying to come up with new drugs, I think. And uh, if you didn't talk neurochemistry, you didn't have any friends, right? So I learned quite a lot about neurochemistry, but the key thing was that um, arguing that a lot of the physiological changes that take place in depression in the brain could well be secondary to psychological and social processes. And so my first book was called uh, From Psychology to Brain State, Depression from Psychology to Brain State, which was really looking at the way in which physiological systems are changed by psychosocial processes. And of course, in 1975, Martin Seligman had come out with Learned Helplessness. There was also work on attachment disruption and changes in the brain and so forth. So I, I was really interested in that process because you'll see why that's important in a bit. And part of the um, evolutionary models of depression at the time was attachment theory. Attachment theory is very important. And then in 89, I wrote a book called Human Nature and Suffering, which was really all about motivational processing. And we looked at caregiving, the, the, the motive to care give, the motive to care receive. We looked at the evolutionary functions of those basic emotives, and we looked at processes of competitive behavior and so forth. But my original uh, research uh, program was very much on competitive behavior, uh, looking in terms of um, um, shame and self-criticism and uh, social comparisons and, uh, and so on. And uh, focusing very much that depressed people often feel inferior, they tend to behave submissively and they're often quite self-critical. So that was really that process. And I was trained in psychodynamic therapy, but also originally in cognitive therapy, Tim Beck's cognitive therapy, which I think is, is still you know, terrific. Um, but I was very interested in motivational processes. And although we're often seen as a third wave cognitive behavior therapy, we're not really that, we've never been that. We certainly use a lot of CBT and other approaches, but we've always been a motivational process because motives really organize your mind. I mean, you know, if you think about going out tonight and you're going to meet your lover or you're going to meet, um, you know, go for a job interview or you're going to meet friends to plan a holiday or you're going to go and talk to somebody you've got going to have an argument with, all of those things will have a very major impact on your brain states. So we were interested, to cut a long story short, about how do you help people who are trapped in this competitive system where they are feeling very self-critical and high shame prone and withdrawing and submissive, could we switch them into a different motivational system? And the motivational system we were very interested in, of course, was caring behavior because caring behavior evolved through attachment. Uh, well, that's one of the I mean, there are many avenues of caring behavior, but one of them was attachment. And attachment evolved to be a threat regulator, such that, you know, that when the child was threatened, they'd return to the parent and the parent would come down uh, to create a secure base and safe haven. So we have a, a, an evolved motivational system that's really important for a sense of connectedness and a sense of threat regulation. And uh, if people can't use it or can't tap into that, uh, they're going to be struggling. So that was the beginning, really. And uh, then that led on to sort of beginning to notice what happened within the therapies. That was sort of the, the background of the science, really, the understanding of evolutionary systems, how evolutionary systems organize your brain, what happens if you get trapped in one of them, particularly the competitive system, and how can you switch people into a caring attachment-based system, which would reorganize your brain and your body and all that. The other way in which we got into it was that we were using a lot of cognitive therapy because cognitive therapy as an intervention, not so much as a model of the mind, but as an intervention, uh, is terrific. Um, so people would have a lot of negative thoughts about you know, the self, the world, and the future, as Tim Beck would say. And they could stand back and come up with alternative thoughts, like, you know, I feel I'm a failure and I haven't really achieved anything. And they would take a more balanced perspective and think, well, actually, no, I have, and 
I'm not really a failure, that's a label. There are some things I've been good at, some things I haven't been so good at. They could do all that, but they would still say, yeah, but you know what? I know I'm not a failure really, but I still feel like I'm a failure. So there was a mismatch between what they were thinking, what they were feeling. And that had been identified, you know, years and years ago, really, not for a long time. And the, the, the solution in CBT was just get more evidence, do more behavioral experiments and so on. But one day I was talking to a lady who had been uh, adopted and had a very strong feeling that she shouldn't have been born, wasn't really lovable and so on, had a very difficult adoption. And, um, but she'd made a, she had a good partner and good relationship with her children. I mean, and she said, yes, I know that, but nevertheless, deep down inside, this is, I still feel, you know. So she was able to come up with the, when she had that feeling, she was able to come up with the alternative thoughts that actually, yes, I feel unlovable, but in fact, my husband has been very caring and we have a good relationship. I've got three, you know, lovely children and so on. She said, yes, I know, I know in my head it's true, but I just can't feel it. So I asked her, how, so when you start to stand back and you look at the reality of your life, that you do have a good relationship and so on, and children and your husband, you've held down a job, you've got friends and so on. How, how do you hear that in your mind? <laughs> she was a little embarrassed. She said, what, what do you mean, how I actually hear it? Yeah, speak it out as you hear it. And she said, okay. Come on, you're doing home to therapy. You got a husband that cares about you, haven't you? You got three lovely children, you've had a job. <laughs> this is sort of, what the hell have you got to be depressed about? So the cognitions were fine, but the emotional criticism was being carried in the emotion that was sort of sitting underneath the thinking. Mm. So that was a bit of a shock. And then I started to ask other clients, so what is the emotion that you hear your uh, coping thoughts and when you create coping thoughts down back and you generate alternative thoughts more balanced thoughts what is the emotion that you hear them in your mind and interestingly a lot of them were either hostile or very cold come on pay attention to the evidence um so the obvious solution was very simple okay let's see we can warm them up a bit you know and i wrote some stuff on warmth bringing warmth into cognitive therapy the important warmth to get them to generate but just to really imagine a compassionate part of you saying these coping thoughts to you really feeling these things and wanting you to be able to deal better with your depression and this person said absolutely not <laughs> i'm doing that um i've never been kind to myself i don't think i deserve to be kind to myself uh i can't see that it's going to be helpful anyway that's a little bit pathetic uh, there must be something that you can make me another trick as it were so the, the, the second shot was really the quite a lot of hostility to doing it, which surprised me a little bit. And the third shot, shouldn't have been a shot really, was the fact that um, all motivational systems have their own trauma memories. So for example, if you love holidays and exploring and you go on holiday um, one year and you get beaten up um, and you get <laughs> sent back in an ambulance or something horrible. Uh, the following year, you've got trauma memory in your exploration system, in your holiday making system, in your motivations to go on holiday. So when you get triggered by seeing an advert, you're not going to suddenly remember all the wonderful holidays. The thing that will hit you first is your trauma. Okay, so, and that's true for all kinds of motivational systems. It's the same in caring systems. Now, if you have a background where people who should have cared for you didn't, they were neglectful or abusive, abusive or what, for whatever reason, you were bullied and so on, what happens is when you start to tap into people's caring systems to get them to begin to feel a sense of caring and support, what you do is you start triggering trauma. And uh, so that was a third shock, really. And so we discovered that you have to... Uh, clean up, as it were, detoxify the caring system in order for them to begin to be able to use the caring system. So compassion focused therapy was really the whole process by which you help people understand the importance of caring motivation for brain organization and emotion regulation, the ability to be uh, empathic and sensitive and understanding of your distress with a genuine desire to be helpful to yourself, basically, to help clients understand that. And then, but actually then, take the toxicity out of the caring system, out of the memories of being hurt or whatever. So that's it, the, there's the sort of evolutionary side to it. These motivational systems are crucial to how your brain is organized. And then 
the recognition that a lot of our clients, they can't use the caring system because it's toxic to them. Um, they don't trust it and so on and so on. That's really interesting. I have to ask, you know, you've mentioned there about sort of detoxifying the caring system. What are the most effective ways that, you know, a therapist can do that? Well, a number of things. Firstly, we have a whole range of processes which we call mind awareness, the ability to differentiate, the ability to tolerate, um, uh, integrate and transform. So mind awareness is really, really a key thing. So the first thing is helping people be aware of it so that they become aware that actually they find compassion tricky because of what's happened to them. They don't trust it or they think it's soft or weak. Or when they begin to practice compassion, that they, they actually feel worse, not better. So when they begin to understand what's happening and why it's happening, that is the first step, okay? Because then you can begin to say, okay, so what we have to do is to begin to detoxify your system. And that's working with trauma. Like if you had been had a car crash or you've been got beaten up on holiday in order to get you driving again or to get you enjoying holidays you'd have to gradually desensitize and work through that so it's the same with the the client so once the client has said okay yeah i can see that so then we start okay so let's see how we can begin to do that for you now there are different ways we can use um we use breathing exercises and body exercises to stimulate the physiology of the caring system, which includes the vagus nerve, frontal cortex, and so on. So there are lots of physiological um, trainings we can do in terms of postures and movement and, um, as I say, breathing and so forth. And Steve Porges has written quite a lot about this in his polyvagal approach. Then there's an awful lot we can do in terms of practicing imagery, okay, imagining a compassionate other who was compassionate to you and working through the feelings that arise when they do that. Um, then there's um, uh, pr practicing safe place, because that's often an issue. So practicing the feelings of safeness. And what's important in safeness is also the ability to play, because another thing that these clients struggle with is play. So uh, one of the things we do, compassionate things we do, is to help people think about the importance of play, to do things simply for the joy of doing them which for some of these clients, that's a very strange thing to be doing. Um, so play is important because it opens, you know, it gives you a secure base, uh, brings joy, all those things. So you've got imagery of the other, creating compassionate image and practice relating to them, dialoguing with the, your compassionate image. Now imagery really is it's designed to stimulate physiological systems. And there's nothing strange about this. I mean, if you're very hungry and you, see a meal that would stimulate your stomach acids but equally it could just you, you might not have any money or you might not actually see it you might just fantasize a meal and that will do the same thing the same obviously the example we use with our clients is sexual imagery if you create images what happens in your body what happens if nothing happens in your body then the image isn't any use is it really so we're not going to be teaching you compassionate imagery we're going to teach you uh, sexual imagery, we're going to teach you compassion imagery, but it's exactly the same principle that because these are archetypal, they're evolved systems that respond to signals. When you send the signal into the system, just like the sexual system is evolved system, you send a signal into the sexual system and it will flood you with hormones and arousal. Same with the compassion system, the care system, send the signal in and provided there's no, it doesn't trigger a trauma, you'll start to stimulate physiological systems. And we know this because there's been quite a lot of studies now looking at what happens to people when they practice compassion imagery and so on, get changes in the brain, change in the vagus nerve. So you get that system going. So that's, that's a very important process to get the physiological um, infrastructure of the caring system going. Um, then we can do things like writing compassionate letters, learning to be compassionate to self and others, doing one compassionate thing for yourself and another person every day, having a clarity about what compassion is and what it isn't. That's very important. Um, so lo lots of, uh, of different interventions that you can use for people. Now, one of the key things is that when you help people develop compassion, it's about understanding the courage and wisdom to engage with pain. So compassion is very different to kindness or niceness or whatever it is. They're very important. We use those two because they're relationship building. But compassion is really focused on developing courage and wisdom to engage with pain. So that becomes a really important process so that if you're dealing with, say, 
trauma, then compassion gives you the courage and the wisdom to deal with traumas, to engage with your trauma, not to avoid it, but to engage with it and gradually heal it. So all of those processes, building the body, helping the body support the mind, the body building exercise, the imagery building exercise, the getting familiar with the experience of compassion, the concepts of compassionate dialogues, concepts of what it is to feel cared about, empathically cared about, that can take a bit of time, and then being able to use those psychologies that you're developing, the skills you're developing, to guide you and support you when you're taking on some of the painful things that you might need to take on that have occurred to you in your life. Again, really interesting. And I suppose since I first, you have a talk at the weekend university back in 2018, I think. And since I first sort of discovered compassion focused therapy, um, I've made a conscious point of trying to be more compassionate towards myself. And I've noticed uh, a big difference in my own sort of subjective well being over time. And it's been a gradual thing, but it's, I definitely would say there's a big difference before and after I discovered this. Um, but whenever I tell people about compassion, particularly like friends or whatever, they're always like really skeptical about, um, the, I think the big fear that people have, especially men, is that if they're compassionate or if, they, if they're too compassionate towards themselves, they're going to get soft and they're going to lose their drive and they're, and they're going to lose their motivation. What would you say to someone like that? And also for a therapist listen to, listening to this that is finding it hard to get a client to start working in a compassionate compassionate way, um, how can they best get through to them? Well, I agree with you, Niels. I mean, I think part of the problem is that, you know, to, to put it harshly, a, a lot of the middle classes have got hold of this compassionate thing and now selling them this kindness and love and all that stuff. And that's all right. I'm not, you know, that's great. If that helps people, but that isn't going to do it for therapy because that will put people off and does put people off. You really got to hammer them with this idea that compassion is this real sensitivity to suffering with a real commitment to do something about it. That you, you know, if you see somebody dying at the side of the road, you don't just walk past. And, um, you know, and for those people who are religious, it's, I'm not particularly religious, you know, we always talk about the compassion of Christ. We don't talk about the kindness of Christ. What a nice person he was, how kind he was, he died for us. No, 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 compassion is really about the, the wisdom and the courage to address suffering, sometimes at a cost to yourself. So that's part of the problem that, you know, we've got a real big misunderstanding about what compassion is, particularly on the internet, and people confuse it with love and all the rest of it. You don't need to love people to be compassionate to them. In fact, the strongest compassion are when you help people you don't like. Now, that, that's real compassion, really. So compassion is this deep sensitivity or a sensitivity to address suffering because, you know, whether you're a Buddhist or whether you're just an ordinary person looking at life, life is full of tra tragedies and traumas and suffering, right? It's full of it. And so you, you've got to find a way that we can get through it. So that's very, very important. And we spend quite a lot of time in helping people understand what we mean by compassion. We use an example of, we say to a client, look, supposing you have a friend, think of a friend, okay. Can you, can you imagine your friend? Yeah, yeah. What do you like about them? I, I like this, like that. Okay, now imagine this friend phones you up and says, they've got to go to hospital, and um, but they're hospital phobic. You know, they have to have this important operation because they're, but the hospital, they can't go, and they're really upset and tearful. How would you be with them? Okay, so then most clients would say, oh, I'd try to understand them, and I'd be sensitive, and I'd be talk to them, and I'd try to encourage them, and I'd tell them I'd be there for them. So you say to them, okay, so when somebody is suffering in that way, maybe they're very frightened of something, or they have to face things, it's very difficult. You would try to be sensitive and understanding. Oh, yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. Well, Okay, then what? What would you do? What would you, what would you do? Oh, I don't know. I try to think about what would be helpful. Maybe I'd go with them to hospital. Okay, why would you do that? Well, when you're frightened, if you've got somebody with you that sort of helps you, that maybe holds your hand, it helps you, doesn't it? Yeah, doesn't it? And then you say, you have intuitive wisdom. That's exactly what compassion is. It's the way we address suffering by being sensitive and working out how to be helpful, how to be supportive how to be there for that person in their pain, in their fear, right? Okay, now what is weak about that? What is soft about that? You might have to give up a day's work, lose a pay, 
to go and take him to hospital. What is soft about that? What is weak about? So it's very important that they get this idea. It's not about being kind and love. I mean, that's, that's those are ways of being compassionate. And then to the guys, you can say, well, what does it take for a firefighter to go into a burning house, right? Well, for it, they have to be sensitive to suffering. They have to be absolutely determined. They don't want that person to burn to death, right? But they'll risk their lives to get them out. That's compassion. What is soft about that? What is soft about that? What is weak about that? And then you help people realize compassion is the most profoundly moral, courageous, wise emotion of all of our motives. All of our motives. It's, it is the one that will help you to engage with suffering, not turn away from it, to try as best you can to address suffering in yourself and in the world as best you can. There's absolutely nothing soft about it because it, at root, it's courage. Because without courage, compassion is ineffective. And without wisdom, it can be reckless. So you need these two together. You, if you're going to address suffering in yourself and others, you need the courage to do it so you don't just turn away from it or try and drink it out of existence or drug your, <laughs> drug your pain away. But you also need to do it wisely because there are many times where we can try to help ourselves and help other people and we actually make things worse. So these are key messages in the therapy that we get across quite early on in the therapy because if you don't undermine some of the nonsense that's going on in the internet, clients will just, they, they won't buy it. 100%. So it seems that just your definition of compassion, there is so much packed in there that's of practical significance and value here. The sensitivity to suffering and the motivation to and commitment to alleviate it. You know, if you understand that, it completely changes how you look at compassion and it turns from being something soft to something that could be the, the hardest thing you ever have to do, you know? The hardest thing you ever have to do and also to prevent it. That's the other thing that we... We added to that. And of course, what you know, make people know this. This is primarily a, this is how the Buddhist, um, this is the Buddhist view. And in the Buddhist view, the, the motivation is to address suffering in all sentient beings and the causes of suffering. That is basically it's called bodhicitta, but that is basically compassion motivation. I am when I'm motivated by compassion, I'm motivated to address suffering in all sentient beings and the causes of it those two things together which which is also to prevent it so that's really the the basis of compassion now when buddhists talk about love they're not talking about love in the western sense of the world i love you or i like you it's not not that at all it's much more of an empathic commitment really love in the buddhist traditions means benevolence benevolent wish the wish for you not to suffer and i can wish that even if i don't like you I certainly may not love you, but I can certainly wish that for you and I can work so that you don't have to suffer. So th these are really, really important distinctions that you're we're making. I think. 100%. And in, in your book with children, Mindful Compassion, you use the metaphor of uh, lotus in the mud. Can you maybe tell us about why you chose, chose that metaphor and the significance of it? Yes, there's an old uh, Thich Nhat Han always used to say, you can't grow a lotus on marble. <laughs> In other words, suffering emerges from the pain of life, from the difficulties of life, really. Um, and that includes the stuff that's going on in our own minds, you know, our potential for anxiety, our potential for rage, our potential for the good and the bad. In other words, if you have a mind that's completely all good, where does compassion come from then how can you understand it you know if you've, if you've never suffered yourself and so on so that's part of it and it's really being in touch with the suffering within us and that our potential to cause it that's the other thing which gives us gives rise to the insight of how powerful and important compassion is okay so one of the things as you know we've talked about this many times is that we're all in favor of compassion for happiness that's great and go for it but um and we certainly do do that, but the most important thing is compassion for the dark side, okay? Because humans, and how we use compassion to prevent the dark side, because humans are one of the most vicious, nastiest species that have ever existed on this planet. I mean, we are absolute demons, 
you know, if you look at our history of war and rape and slavery and, I mean, torture and what's going on in Ukraine is just a microscopic of what's happened for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, you think of the Roman games and crucifixions and burning people at the stake. And I mean, you can go on and on and on, can't you really? So th there is something seriously problematic with the human mind. But compassion can stand against that. Compassion can help us begin to understand why we are like that and what it is we need to do in order to create social and political contexts that don't bring those uh, dark sides out of us. You know, it's, it's a Star Wars thing, isn't it? You know, beware the power of the dark side. Um, and we're beginning to understand what it is that stimulates dark side psychology. And it's nearly always to do with two things, you know, the sense of threat and the sense of needing control and to be powerful, you know, make me great or whatever. Um, uh, when people got that sense of entitlement and specialness, they can treat others like objects for their own amusement or gratification, then you've got trouble. <coughs> and uh, unfortunately, neoliberalism does that in spades. We, we, we are living in a society which is um, constantly pushing uh, pushing the need for individuals to compete against each other, and it's a disaster. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So there's a few things I I'm curious to ask. Um, so I'll ask them at once in case I forget. So the first one is, we talked there about you know there's a there's no doubt that human beings there's a dark side to our nature. You know, yeah. there's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and it seems that what you're getting at is that if we shift to a compassionate way of being in the world, that that becomes our primary motivation system and the dark side then isn't given expression, I suppose. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, we have things like sports and we have, you know, you have games that involve a bit of uh, violence, I suppose. Um, and do you think there's any case that can be made for having an outlet for that that side of our nature or do you think we should just completely ignore the dark side that, that's the first question and the second question is what we talked there we live in a very neoliberal culture where we're super competitive and we're constantly you know tr we're constantly driving for success and striving for you know making more money and all these different things how different would our world actually look? Have you thought of this? How different would our world look if compassion was the central value and it was being taught to children in, in schools from a young age? Very different. Look, it's not, I mean, I think it's a wonderful question because it's not complicated, right? I mean, the, the thing is, after the Second World War, okay, we had a compassion orientation. We wanted to nest build. We wanted to rebuild our communities. I mean, America had the New Deal, and then they had the Marshall Plan to rebuild Germany. I mean, it was partly business. Obviously, they needed, or it wasn't totally um, compassion orientated by any means. But they realized a number of things: don't humiliate an enemy, make sure they're built up, make sure they don't have envy, and so on. Don't do what we did in in 1922 and and really hammer Germany and so on and so on. So that that we we kind of know these things. Uh, and in the UK, we built a national health service, which became the envy of the world. We had no money. We'd just been through a terrible war. We owed the Americans whatever. But we had a tax system that was designed to support building infrastructure. And this was really a dream to make everything a fairer, better society. And that was doing OK. The 60s began to introduce, and it was my generation, let it all hang out and it's what I want to do and I should be free to do whatever I want to do regardless of being responsible. I mean, we had the peace movements and all the rest of it, but there was an awful lot, awful lot of, of pretty narcissistic stuff there as well. And then, of course, uh, as we go into the 80s, we had the big neoliberal uh, process of backlash against taxation with Reagan and Thatcher, who in my view did a terrific amount of damage to um, social sentiment. So... And we've really never recovered from it. So taxes came right down and, and um, the idea of, uh, uh, of redistributing wealth from the high to the low 
um, really has got lost. And now we live in a world with gross inequalities, gross inequalities of wealth. Nobody seems to be able to do anything about it. Everybody seems to shy away from the obvious process of wealth free um, organization. But it doesn't have to be massive. I mean, it has to be a little bit. I mean, it's it's ridiculous that people earn billions of pounds with some of their you know, football players, you know, 50,000 pound a week or whatever it is. I mean, we know this is just ridiculous. So, so that's that's the important thing. A little bit of common sense would be very helpful. That's the first thing. Just get a proper tax system that allows you to raise the money you need to raise in order to build a proper compassionate care, caring community. I mean, the health service has been smashed to pieces because of tax cuts. To, I mean, I worked in it for 40 years. I saw it happening, you know, year after year after year, cut, 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 cut. You can't sustain that, right? And that, that's a betrayal of the basic principles of the 50s or the post-war generation who fought uh, Nazi and fascism, an absolute betrayal of those dreams that people had after the war. So, uh, so that's, now when you ask about competitiveness, competitiveness is very, very important. You channel it, right? But there are two things to be competitive about. You can be competitive for status and the contribution. Now in hunter-gatherer societies, Con com competing happened, of course it did, but it was all about who could make the biggest contribution. <laughs> not for me, but, you know, so it was co contributing to be seen as useful and an altruist. So that's kind of what you compete for and how you compete is very important. And the other thing I think sport is a brilliant example because sport is great because it's regulated, right? It's regulate highly regulated competition with clear rules, and increasingly, it's become more respectful. It's still a little bit um, problematic with some players disrespecting other players. But if you didn't have that, right, you'd no regulation of competition, you'd go back to you know drug taking and cheating and stuff because people would. That, but you control the dark side. You very strongly regulate it because you have very strong checks and balances and referees and stuff like. That. If you did that for business we'd live in a very different world. If business couldn't hide tax in these offshore accounts, if they couldn't exploit their workforce, if you had rules and regulations, yeah, you compete, but let's make sure we compete correctly. And the other thing that's very interesting about sport is that what you find is that managers move around the world. So I love cricket. So we have got somebody who used to manage New Zealand, now is played for New Zealand, now managing England, and people move their skills and talents around. Okay, in business, you can't do that. So in a good example is Pfizer, right? Pfizer has made billions of pounds out of their vaccine, but they will not release their IP. And so what we've got is third world countries still only about 10% of people vaccinated or whatever the figure is. This is immoral. This is absolutely immoral. And this is because competition is unregulated. They can do what they want. They can hold their IP um, and so on and so on. But, you know, if you want to to make a world that is a compassionate world, then sure, have competition, but actually just regulate it so that people do not abuse it in the way that people are abusing their competitive power at the moment. I mean, it's, it's just, <laughs> so business is great, you know, competing is great, people want to compete, they want to have an opportunity to shine and show how good they are, that's fine, that's absolutely fine, but not to then use their positions of power to exploit uh, others and so on and so on. That would be my view. So you can't get rid of competition, but you, but if you regulate it, it can be really, really good. Hundred percent. Now, every time I speak to you, Paul, it always strikes me how much you your your thought is it's rooted in evolutionary theory and evolutionary psychology, and it seems that that has had a big influence on the development of of CFT as well. Um, now, for this this summit is for people working in the healthcare profession, professions. Um, why would you say it's important for people to have a, a basic grasp of evolution if they're going to be working in this in this space? Well, um, my own personal view is that you know, we, how can you possibly understand how bodies and minds function if you don't understand how evolution built them? Why have you got a heart? Why have you got a liver? Why have you got eyes? And evolution is built there, all of that. It's all been built to do certain things, right? Basically, all of us are DNA created 
of biological machines in a way. That's but we don't operate like machines, but we've all been created. We will come into existence, we'll live for a little bit, and then we'll off we go. We, we die and pass away. You know, this constant cycle of life and death, life and death. So DNA is this, is this sort of like a factory of creating beings and living beings. And 99% uh, of all the life forms that have ever existed are now, no, they don't, they've gone extinct. So that's quite an important process that we're all caught up in this sort of factory that creates us against our will, or at least we never chose it. I mean, you didn't choose to be born the gender or the ethnicity where you are and into the parents you've got. I didn't choose it. None of us choose it. No living thing chooses to be what it is. It just comes into existence. And then it has to kind of figure it out. So this is very important. So why? Why has this been created? What's it there to do? Well, two things, survive and reproduce. Oh, so I see. Okay, so maybe these are quite important processes to think about. So how does it do that? Oh, well, it has these different motivational systems. So we begin to understand that the mind emerges out of, you know, childhood to become uh, uh, an individual that's struggling for survival and reproduction, and they'll have a whole range of motivations to do that, and they'll have all kinds of desires that can be helpful or not. So those motivations for power or narcissism or aggression or love or attachment, they're all created, they're all part of our biological being. So th these are, from my point of view, these are really important things to understand that they've been built into us, not by us, but we have an ability, we don't think animals do, but we have an ability to be mindful and to become aware of how our programming is working, okay? So yes, I have an anger system that was built into me, I didn't build that, but I can become aware of how it works, what triggers it. I can become aware that if I just act out my anger, I can be harmful to others. I can become aware that actually I can feel anger without, blaming myself, but on the other hand, I want to regulate my behavior. I can, I can work out what's triggering it. I can, you know, I can begin to use my new brain, my mindfulness, my capacity for conscious awareness of being, which we don't think other animals have, but we do. So it's a very special evolutionary sh shift, which makes us a fundamentally different species in some ways. I can use these evolved competencies to really take control over my mind and begin to harness my mind and cultivate my mind more in a way that fits my values as a compassionate being, right? Because otherwise, you know, your mind is a bit like a garden. If you don't do anything to it, it will grow and it will change according to the forces and the factors that are working upon it, you know? But if you cultivate it, if you begin to understand it, if you begin to understand what supports the compassion within you, what supports your courage, what supports your values, what supports your basic humanity, what supports your morality, and you cultivate that part of you, all right, there are systems in your brain that will then start working for you. It's like if you've got, you know, your biceps, okay, you've got muscles here, if I don't do anything with them, they'll be okay, but if I go to the gym, I can really develop my strengths, right, so I've got them, uh, and if I do these exercises, I can become quite strong. So it's the same with compassion. And you've, got, you've got these potentials, but if you really exercise those potentials, you can become a really compassionate being, and that will have a fun, that'll have a profound effect on your well-being, on your ability to relate to others, uh, and so on and so on. Just like going to the gyms, you, you'll get fit. <laughs> compassion, fitness. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something that, strikes me as so important about about all of this is that c compassion in your view and i would certainly probably agree with this is that it's a it's a motive it's it's not an not an emotion it's you know it's it's primary and everything else flows from that your thoughts your feelings your behaviors flow from the motivation so that's sort of sits at the top and everything else flows below and you can either be in a compassionate mind or you can be in a, a competitive competitive mind most of the time and something i heard you say is that you know the choice the choice to focus on compassion or to develop compassion it changes the whole orientation of your mind you, the nature of your mind and i think this is so important when we're thinking about life choices and what goals we're going to pursue because 
the things that we the things that we we pursue are gonna gonna influence that you know so what what are your thought what are your thoughts on that and what can you tell tell us a bit about the difference between choosing compassion based goals and pride based goals yeah so that's that's really interesting Neil so um <clears throat> The first thing is insight into how these things work, right? So compassion uh, has so many positive impacts on your physiology, on your vagus nerve, on your cardiovascular system, on your immune system. So many positive things that are good for you and for building relationships and, and so on and so on. So you know, there are very few downsides to compassion. You know, people say, oh, can you be too compassionate? No. You can be unwisely compassionate. Yeah, you can. You can be. You know, if I jump into a fast-flowing river to save somebody, that might look compassionate, but not if I can't swim, right? So that would be. That wouldn't be too much compassion. It would be rather stupid compassion. So you can get that. That's true. So the the key thing then is understanding. So what 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 is it? It's these values to address suffering and and to prevent it wherever you can root out the causes of suffering, so that's important. Now, pride is much more to do with uh, how you feel you're doing in terms of your goals, whether you're succeeding or you're not. So when you're doing well, you can have pride, but you can also have pride in how you deal with failing. So pride, you know, I'm proud of myself because I really picked myself up after that and I got going against it. So pride is really about a positive, having the positive feelings about what you're doing. Now, I once heard the Dalai Lama said that we can make a distinction between pride and confidence. So pride can be that sense. The pride gets a little bit more tricky when it's to do with how you think other people see you, that you want to be seen, you know, you pop your chest out. Uh, uh, so I'm proud because people will see me and I've won the competition and everybody's going to applaud me. That kind of pride is a little bit more tricky uh, because that is really then you start working for the the applause of others right so I want, I, I want to succeed because i want the applause i want to feel proud i want my parents to feel proud of me that's a little bit more tricky so you got to be a little bit careful with that um but you know taking joy and pleasure from achievement that's a good thing um and also the point about confidence the ability to be able to have confidence in your ability not only to succeed but to deal with failure now, this is one of the key things that is such an important thing, you know, when we talk to clients, because sometimes we say to our clients, you know, I'm going to teach you how to fail. <laughs> so what? I don't want to learn how to fail. Uh, yes, you do. Because the moment you can fail and you're not frightened about it and it doesn't destroy you is the moment that you will be prepared to do, you know, whatever you need to do. You won't be frightened of failing. You don't want to fail. Nobody wants to fail. But fear of failing won't stop you. You've got to be wise and not saying you're reckless. That's that's not the point. But a lot of people are really worried about failing. You know, they they then they become self-critical and so forth. But if you learn that actually failing is often the place where we do the most growth, uh, that can be really, really helpful. But if you beat up on yourself and are critical and, and uh, think other people are going to look down on you and shame you, and failure becomes a really frightening thing and you can't risk it. So pride then is this capacity to kind of feel good about what you're doing, which includes your ability to cope with setbacks and you can be feeling good about that. And that's linked to confidence. Whereas social pride is more to do with wanting to be esteemed in the eyes of others. And that's okay. We all want it. I like it as well. But you've got to be a little bit careful that it doesn't come a bit of a drug and you then you have to work for it. You have to have it. <laughs> 100%, 100%. Um, so just going back there to what you said about failure, and you have to have the ability to feel, it reminded me of the time. So whenever I started my first business, I was, I think I was 20 or 21. And I was running it for wasn't even that long, it was about nine or 10 months, but it was becoming very clear that a I was really not enjoying it. And b it wasn't going to work out in the long run, right? And I had a conversation with my father at the time and he basically said, he basically said like, look, um, this isn't the end of the world. If you decide to step away from it, like if you want to, you know, step back from this, you can try other things, experiment with different, different things. And, you know, um, you'll be okay. And it's, it's just one step in a, 
in your life and I'm not communicating that really, really well, what the, the benefit I got from that, but basically him, him communicating that to me at that young age gave me um, sort of the confidence to pursue other things and know that I would be okay regardless if, if, I, if I failed or not. And it strikes me that if you, if you are going to um, fail at things or you're going to have the freedom to fail, you've got to have a secure base, whether that's from somebody else or whether that's internally. Would you, would you think a similar way to that? Or yeah, what are your thoughts on? I think yeah, it helps you to have a secure base undoubtedly, but what helps you more is don't uh, beat up on yourself. Don't, you know, don't kick yourself when you're down. When you, when you fail, you got to work with the emotions of the failure that you might be angry about it or very sad about it, or you go through a lot of losses your ability to go through the experiences of the failure, what, you know, the grieving or the anxiety about the future or the anger that has happened, the big three, because as you know, we use the big three in CFT, those big three. That's really, really important. But if at the same time you start beating up on yourself and telling yourself you're useless and it shouldn't have happened, then you, then that, now you're in trouble because you haven't got any grounding. So part of your secure base is an agreement with yourself that, if things don't go well, then you will deal with the emotions of that. Like it could be a relationship, isn't it, that breaks up, then you will grieve for that or be angry for that, but actually not beating up on yourself. Now, that doesn't mean to say you never reflect on your behavior and realize if you, in ways in which you might have contributed to that, in ways you can learn and, and, and be better. I'm not suggesting a non-reflective process. It's more the, the harsh, aggressive attacking. Mm -hmm. That's when you get into trouble and just allowing yourself to be as it is. When we were young, when our kids were young, we used to have a saying, it was WFF, you know, if you tried just, you've tried your hardest and it doesn't work out, well, what the fuck? We say, well, what the fuck? Well, I can't, I've, I've done my best, I can't, you know, that's it. That's it. And you let go. And they used to like that. Um, so, try your best but then if it doesn't well i have to let it go you know that's that's the way it is so allowing yourself to come to terms this concepts of coming to terms not grasping and clinging and all of that stuff that you get in the buddhist traditions is such an important point but once again that doesn't mean that you don't persevere see persevering is different from grasping and clinging persevering is just this steadfastness to pursue your your goal was grasping and clinging is more, I've got to, I have to, you know, I'll go, uh, get all that stuff. So these are very important, but they're subtle, but very important distinctions about the importance of the ability to deal with failure because it can, it, it, it's always upsetting, of course, you, but you, it can be a great source of growth as well and wisdom. 100%. Um, so I'm just curious, I'm just conscious of time here, Paul. Do you have a hard stop at four or have you got until no, five? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so two other questions I want to ask were about um, shame. So you've done a lot of research into shame and self-criticism and that. And we spoke to uh, Lou Cozzolino. I'm not sure if you're familiar, familiar with his work. He's got a yeah. theory on, on core shame. And from what I understand, he was basically saying that that would have been adaptive in our evolutionary past from the group's point of view. And I'm just curious about what your thoughts on on uh, why that might have evolved in humans and the, the self-criticism as well. Yeah, well, that's great. I mean, uh, he, he's done some brilliant stuff on the um, neuroscience and psychotherapy and uh, attachment relationships. I mean, he's, he does terrific stuff. I think the key thing to be slightly careful with um, understanding the different levels about what shame is about, where it comes from. So we make a distinction between internal shame and external shame, as you know. So external shame is really the shame I feel when I see what's going on in your mind, that you're looking down on me. And I may not feel shame at all until you uh, criticize me and so on and so on. So we can see then that social dynamic of shame is very important. For example, how people have been shamed for their sexuality in years gone by and what a tough fight LGBT people have had to kind of just own their own sexuality because, you know, 100 years ago or whatever, and in some 
religious communities whose sexualities are highly shamed. So that's external shame. And what happens is then people kind of bend around that, then they can become ashamed themselves of their own sexual feelings because they've internalized that. So that, that we need to see that that is a process by which shame can enforce conformity because people become frightened of rejection and so forth. Now, whether you want to see that as a positive thing or not, I'm not sure. I, I think there are problems with that view. Um, the other point is that in animals, when they're threatened by a, a dominant, they have to show submissive behavior. And if they don't, they get they can get injured and even killed. There's some really interesting stuff by um, Heighton some years ago, tracking baboons and looking at young adolescents as they came into their so the adolescents started to push for authority. If they didn't pay attention to who was really the boss, they did get killed. They got quite badly injured because they, they challenged the dominant and then they don't. So submissive behavior is incredibly important. Now what submissive behavior does is it makes you show exact or very similar behaviors to shame. So you put your head down, you don't do eye gaze because eye gaze is a threat, right? You put your head down, you try and make yourself smaller, you're covering your face. All of these suggest that the uh, archetypal origin of shame is in submissive behavior where you perceive the other as un offering some kind of attack to you, some whatever. And that's why the first part of what I was talking about is so important. So we've inherited that part of ourselves to be wary of doing things that could invite attack from others uh, from our primate history. And for sure, uh, submissive behavior, if for many animals saves their lives and they don't submit, they get severely injured. Knowing your place, right? Don't get too explorative, don't get too confident if you're in a submissive position. So shame really tracks that evolutionary process of being sensitive to how you are being perceived and whether you are worthy of attack and rejection or not. Now, you could say, oh, well, that's useful then. Well, it might be, but it really depends on the group. Uh, because um, supposing you want to stand against um, the conformity of the group, maybe you're in the Aztec communities and you want to say, I don't, you know, I'm an Aztec and we sacrifice our children, but I don't think we should be doing that. <laughs> Okay, if you get shamed, then you end up on the altar yourself, right? People have stood up against um, slavery and have been absolutely slated. You think about how women had to fight for, you know, the right to vote, the, the, the suffragettes. They were absolutely slated. You know, women claiming their sexuality, they, they should be allowed to enjoy whatever sexual feelings they like. Slated. Right, so shame, mm, I'm not sure about shame. I think shame can also be used in a very bad way and it forces conformity to behaviors that are pretty bad um, because people do not want to be shamed. They do not want to stand against the thing. Um, so shaming individuals is often a means of controlling them. And that, I would see that as a problem. Um, sometimes you, you, people want to shame companies for immoral behavior or whatever. Um, and that can bring them into line. But the idea of using shame to regulate behavior, I think you've got to be careful with that. I mean, yes, I can see it. Uh, the most important emotion in our uh, system is guilt, because guilt is, is focused on one thing only, which is causing harm, all right? And that you do want. So when we're working in the prisons, for example, we're often wanting to not work in the shame dimension, but we are wanting to work in the guilt dimension. So people can start to take responsibility for having caused harm. And guilt is associated with very different emotions. Guilt is associated with the feelings of remorse and sadness and desires to repair, whereas shame is associated with hiding and fear and closing down. That's not, that's not very helpful. So, um, guilt is an incredibly important social process that we can be sensitive to the pain we cause others and sometimes ourselves and want to make amends for that. Uh, that's really important. But uh, shame, in my view, is tricky. So you've got to be careful with it because a lot of people in our hospitals and our prisons are riddled with it and it's not a good thing. That uh, it seems to me it's so important to make a very sharp distinction between those two things. And in, yeah. my, in my mind, before this conversation, they sort of come in one bundle together, but they're two very, very different things, you know. Um, 
just a couple more questions. To, to yeah, so external shame is linked to stigma and stigmatizing, of course. Those, those are all linked to things. And you can have people in what we call stigma consciousness. They're worried about being seen as linked to uh, stigma. You know, there's a very, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm going to use the example of St. Peter uh because i when i was at school got hammered with these things you know saint peter denying that he knew anything about jesus you know when the roman soldier says to you you were you were a friend of jesus i saw you with jesus no 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 i've never seen him before uh don't associate me with that look i'm not part of them you know what i mean i'm not one of those <laughs> but people with mental health problems have that you know don't i'm not neurotic you know i'm not just a depressive you know i'm not you know i'm not an alcoholic so again shaming and stigma um, can be a bit tricky and people try to avoid feeling they've been labeled in certain ways um but yeah so, so but anyway as i said but guilt see shame comes from the rank system it comes from the competitive system it's about being looked down on it's about being under social attack of some kind whereas guilt evolved out of the caring system is a very different motivational system which is avoidance of harm now that's important because in an attachment system the parent has to avoid harming the infant by laying on them or whatever. She has to be sensitive not to cause harm and not causing harm to your offspring is really important. Tragically, that happens, of course, people abuse their kids and so forth. But generally speaking, caring comes with a desire not to cause harm. And if you do cause harm, to repair it and to have a, a negative emotional reaction to it. Now, interestingly, guilt you don't really want too much anxiety because that could make people back off what you want is an emotion that will move them to take action to repair that's why sadness is such an important part of guilt. it's very sad you know i'm so sorry i didn't mean to do that that feeling of sorrow um is such an important because it pushes you to reparation uh, whereas shame won't necessarily do that i mean if you have a you know two people who've had an affair and their wives or their partners discover it, and one has a shame response and thinks, oh gosh, you know, I'm a bad person. She's thinking I'm a bad person. I've got to, you know, I'll go and buy her some flowers or him some flowers. Um, then it'll all be. So when that is a shame reparation, but it's not really about being sensitive to the harm to the other. It's all about me, I feel bad, and you feel bad about me, and I feel bad about me, and you feel bad about me. So I've got to try and repair my reputation. I've got to try and repair my sense of self. But in guilt, I don't care about me. I just want to repair you because I've hurt you. Okay. And so I'm more motivated to, I'm not thinking about whether I'm a good or a bad person or not. I just want to try and do something that will repair the harm that I've caused you, maybe upset you or something. So they are, they're very different motives, very different histories, very different physiological systems very different emotions and it's very important to distinguish them because um helping children be able to process guilt without feeling ashamed or without seeing it as a weakness is very very important yeah and again it's just going back to what you're saying about the importance of understanding evolution because this helps us to make sense of all these different things um it's like that guy said Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Well, you, right. you're, ca you're casting a very big floodlight <laughs> on human nature. Yeah. Just final question, Paul. Um, we're asking all of our all of our interviewees this for the summit. Um, if you could recommend three books that you think every mental health professional should read in their lifetime, what would what would those three books uh, be? They could be your own books. They could be books that have impacted you, books that you've gifted to others. Um, anything come to mind when I ask that question? Well, yes, I mean, uh, uh, one book was very influential in me, which is a lovely book. It's called The Discovery of the Unconscious by Ellen Berger. Uh, it was came out in 1970, but it's a beautifully written book. And it really is the history of the development of um, psychotherapy up until all the way through and some really fascinating uh, discussions about Genet and Freud and Jung and and on through to the um, some of the ego analysts. Now it is it is a little bit psychodynamically oriented, but it is it is a beautifully written book, and it's full of wow, wowy insights. I think that's quite a, an amazing book. Um, <clears throat> obviously, any of the books that are associated with your own particular school of psychotherapy. Now, for me, another book which um, was very influential was uh, Archetype: A Natural History of the Self by Anthony Stevens because I love archetype theory and uh, some really 
um, great stuff in architectures. I mean, you know, like with all the stuff, there's nonsense, isn't there, as well? And some of the stuff is in certain compassion focus area. I'm sure we've got a lot of nonsense as well. So, um, yeah, so so those are um, two books that were of influence to me, whether I would um, recommend them. Another book, which um, obviously, you know, our new book on compassion focus therapy, but another book, I think, which is really um fantastic book um which came out recently it's called civilized to death um which is uh, i'm just trying to think of the author i think it's gray uh, so chris ryan yes yes thank you i don't know i don't know where i've got the name gray but chris ryan that is a wonderful book i had it as an order order, order book um so that is a uh, and that really it's not really a psychopathology book or a mental health book, but it really contextualizes many of the issues about why we have some of the problems we do because we're we're living outside of our hunter-gatherer context, really. So I that was a book that I really enjoyed. So um awesome. Yeah, I mean I've got loads of other books, but I mean that's um <laughs> that would do for now. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for those, Paul, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, after the interview, where can people go online to learn more about uh, the Compassionate Mind Foundation, your work, and for someone that wants to, you know, go deep in compassion-focused therapy after this, what are their options? Yes, yeah, so um, <clears throat> they can go to the website, www compassionate mind one word compassionate mind one word dot go dot uk and you'll find many uh things on the website to tell you about what it is uh, lots of personal practices lots of research and we also run uh, a whole range of uh, workshops and training workshops on introductory courses in the compassion focused therapy for voice hearing and for trauma and as shame and self-criticism and all kinds of things. And we also now have a diploma, which runs for a year, which is online, or it might be hybrid, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, but anyway, there will be an online facility and uh, you get uh, uh, lectures and teachings and workshops from people all over the world who are doing CFT. You get uh, you, you are included into a small clinical supervision group of about four people with a clinical supervisor for a year where you bring and talk about your cases and uh, and and you know people really like it <laughs> so they they uh, so that, and then you get a diploma at the end of all of that so uh, that's a that is quite an intense course and people have been on that course we used to run it at the university have said it's you know it's revolutionized the way they think about themselves and therapy um but i'm gonna say that aren't i of course i'm not gonna say anything different to that so uh you, you <laughs> you'd have to just take me on trust for that <laughs> brilliant brilliant and your new book just published there a couple of months ago can you tell us about that as well yes it's called compassion focused therapy and clinical applications uh it took it's quite a big book. Um, so I wrote the first uh, third of it, going into a lot of the um, evidence uh, for this way of thinking. Um, and then there's, uh, I think, 15 chapters, like, yeah, 15 chapters, uh, with notable people from around the world writing about, um, you know, um, CFT for in groups, CFT for trauma, CFT for anger, CFT for anxiety, you know, CFT for emotion regulation, lots of different applications of CFT. But CFT is really, basically CFT is if you can get a motivational system, the caring system with its vagus and frontal cortex working, and you then use that to do your therapy, we find that the therapy works a lot better. <laughs> so what the, the therapy techniques you're using work better. For example, supposing you're working with somebody who's agoraphobic, right? Can you imagine if when they start exposing themselves, they have a process in their mind that's constantly encouraging and supportive and validating their difficulties? You know, look, it's understandable why you're feeling the way you are. You know, you had a brain that was built that way. It's not your fault, but you're doing great. Take a step at a time. Look how well you're doing. And using that voice tone, that really friendly voice tone, okay? And imagine somebody smiling with you, encouraging you, encouraging you, encouraging you. We find that when you do that, um, 
people can actually tolerate uh, a lot more pain and suffering and uh, they, they heal it much quicker. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, well, we've barely... We need, the data. we need the data, of course we do. And people say, where's your data? Well, actually, we, we've got a big meta-analysis coming that's being done and it looks really nice. But, you know, like all therapies, you know, there's room for improvement. And the other thing is to say is compassion-focused therapy. So there are many, 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 many techniques, if I can use that word, in cognitive therapy and emotion-focused therapy and ACT, or wonderful things, right? they're great right so we need to learn from each other we need to learn that we don't all have the, the full library of techniques of course we don't but what we suggest is that if you can get that motivational system the caring system that, that one that really stimulates that deep desire to to address suffering and see change if you can get that going that really helps you with your techniques Whereas if you're getting a push or kind of, I've got to do this or I'm stupid, or if you've got that, that makes it more difficult. 100%. So it's a foundational principle that is foundational. Pl applicable to all forms of psychotherapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, honestly, Paul, like <clears throat> I, I have enough here to ask you for another two hour conversation on top of this, but that's what I want to say. Like we've barely scratched the surface on, on your work. So anybody that is, you know, listening to this and is curious about compassion and its application in therapy, definitely um, check out some of the resources that we'll link to in the show notes and the, the, the resources that Paul's mentioned. Um, Paul, before you go, I just want to, um, I just want to say a huge thank you for the, the work that you're doing and that you have done over the years. And I think, um, the contribution that you've made towards our understanding of compassion and how it can help to just help alleviate suffering is going to, you've sort of laid a foundation here that's going to be, that's going to have impact for decades and decades and decades to come. So I just want to say thank you for what you're doing and for everything you've put out into the world. It's making a huge difference. So I just want to say that and all the best. Thank you, Niels. I'm going to put you in my pocket. And when I'm feeling depressed, I'm going to take you out and say, can you tell me that again, please? <laughs> anyway, I'll let, you, I'll let you go and take care, all right? It's been a pleasure.